So first of all, we'll jump on brand positioning and targeting segmentation, and we'll talk about how do you bring all this together in a launch. Jeff, come and tell us the story of your life. No, your launches. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Can you. everyone hear me OK? Great. So first of all, I just want to endorse what uh, Michael has said with this framework. You know, I have been uh, fortunate to work in um, you know, multinational hardware companies, software companies. I've sold desktop software, you know, box software. I've sold enterprise software, consumer software, software as a service, open source. I've been involved with a lot of different types of companies at various different stages, from really small to very large. And I got to tell you, if you, at this stage of your career, are planning on building, you know, making a dent in the universe, or you just want to build a billion dollar you know, personal balance sheet, um, and you want to do it in high technology, the frameworks that Michael is giving you are absolutely relevant. And over the course of your career, everything, everything on those, those frameworks, both this one and others, will become very important to you, and you need to understand it. Now, for every company, that, the, ne the next you know, new venture that you go and do, certain things are going to be more important than others. So you, know, you don't need to be overwhelmed by everything. You, know, you focus in on a, a few specific things. But what he has given to the, to the world here with the Startup Secrets is, is stuff that is really valuable. These are the words we use in the industry. These are the things that we do. And uh, it's incredibly, incredibly useful. So let's talk about launch secrets for a little bit. A little bit. Now, I think every great product and every great company deserves a launch. And I've been um, very fortunate to have been part of many, many product launches, many company launches. And it's an incredibly powerful way of driving value around your, your business. Let's first talk about you know, what, is, <coughs> what is a launch when, we, when we're talking about a launch of, of something. Um, well, externally, it's a public announcement that secures widespread coverage in the press and in social media, builds your brand leadership position, really puts you out there as a leader in a space, and drives a significant surge in demand for your products. So that's what you want externally. So it's something that you do, an orchestrated set of activities that just launches your product or your company or both into the marketplace in a, in a high profile way. And not every startup ever achieves that. And it's, and, it's, and it's too bad. And some do and some don't. The ones who do have markedly more success than the ones who don't. And then internally, it's a way, particularly as you become a little bit larger organization, Launches can be in a way of driving alignment that otherwise is really hard to do. And it gets everybody synchronized and working towards the same goal and allows you to go to market and prepares yourself to go to market and be very successful in executing your go-to-market strategy. And so for that reason, launches don't just happen you know, in 72 hours. Um, I've done some, pro some, some big announcements that you know, we had an idea on Monday and we were in the market with it on a Wednesday and it was really awesome. But most cases, your, your, your product launches, your company launches are going to be <coughs> multi-week or multi-month efforts across a bunch of different people. So that's some definitions. Let's jump into the meat here and look at what, what can actually happen. So this is actually the result of a launch. This is um, Brico 4, which is uh, back, uh, 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 a launch that we did back in 2009, uh, right after I joined uh, Brico. This is the headline that appeared on TechCrunch, on the, on the home page of TechCrunch, and you click in, you get here. And this was massively you know, tweeted uh, out there. This was just one article of, of many. We had literally hundreds of articles that were published on that day um, in support of this launch. This happened to be Eric Schoenfeld, one of the lead um, writers at TechCrunch. And this was back in the day when TechCrunch was you know, really the place where you wanted to get coverage. They've since, I think, faded a little bit from where they are. And other publications are taking their place. But this was a huge, huge um, hit for us. And what's fascinating about it is that when I came to the company um, as the new CMO, I asked, you know, what are we, what are we shipping? What are, what are we doing? What, what, what's the product roadmap? What, what's coming up? What, what can we go and talk to the market about? I want to make some noise. And the engineering team was like, well, we got a little of this, and we got a little of that, and this is going to be available here, and this is going to be available there. And Frankly, none of it in isolation was that exciting. But what I realized is that if we took all the stuff that was being released in the in you know, software as a service model, because that, that's how we operate, so we're releasing stuff every week. But if we took all the stuff that was released over a period of time and we bucketed it into specific themes 
and we hit those things and develop messaging for those specific themes and we put it all together, we could actually launch it as a thing. So this is a launch that was made up out of whole cloth, to be honest with you. Okay? It was not like it was a big software release we were working on for a year. It was just the normal software delivery cycle of new features that are coming out all the time in a software as a service model. But we chose to actually bundle it up, a bunch of you know, a, a little bits and pieces, and make a significant launch out of it. Now what's funny about it is that Eric actually um, was a little on to us. If you look at his article, he says, I'm not sure why Bright Cove holds all this stuff, good stuff back until they can package it in a new numbered release since it's a web-based service, which could just as easily upgrade on a rolling basis. But doing it all at once like this does highlight all the changes to the code base and shows why Brightcove is considered the leading web platform for professional use. So he asks a question and then he answers his own question um, to a certain degree. And so I think that, you know, that was skating pretty close to the edge there. But actually that shows the power of great marketing when you can really build a message and tie something together and go deliver it into the marketplace. So we got massive coverage. We continued our leadership position, and we didn't have to change anything we were doing on the engineering side. So it was a very successful launch from that perspective. And we ended up doing you know, Brightco 5 uh, as well. So what are some of the elements of a, of a great launch? Well, first of all, timing is key. Um, if you can find and anticipate waves of communications that are going on in the industry, whether it's you know, Apple's you know, uh, developer uh, event, or whether it's um, uh, you know, a, an industry event or something else, <coughs> or somebody else's product launch that you want to be a reaction to, and you can spot that in advance, having your uh, an announcement appropriately timed before or after something else that's going on can be very, very powerful. And that's hard to do. You can't always do it. And sometimes you wake up and realize that, you know, you chose the launch date that's the, the, the same, happens to be the same date as, you know, the iPhone 6, which would, would be kind of, kind of rough, because you're not going to get much coverage that day. Um, but timing, if you can anticipate, can be really, really powerful. Now, influencers and customers are essential. You need to be able to pick some people in your industry who are the key influencers who people will actually listen to and get them on board in advance. And, and some of those should be customers, of course, who are going to be references for what you're doing. Why do you need them? Well, one, you want to validate your story and your messaging and make sure that it's on target. But when you go and talk to press and do pre-briefing, which is the next step, you want to be able to say, and it's not just me saying this, you should go talk to Fred. Fred is so bright. Everybody knows Fred is really smart in this area. You should go talk to him. And if he's already pre-briefed and they pick up the phone and call him, and he's like, oh, yeah, this stuff is amazing, then that's a really good way that you can get credibility for your launch. So the pre-briefing is really essential. Um, pick one or more outlets that you want to go deep with. And I say outlets meaning um, publications or blogs or you know, people who have, uh, who have influence and reporters. And pick one of those and pitch them an exclusive is one way that you can do it. Or you can pick a handful and say, we're only giving this story to X number of, uh, of press. So you got to you know, converse with your agency and, and look at the norms in your industry and what the reporters will actually do. Some reporters won't take exclusives. TechCrunch back in the day at this time had a policy of no exclusives. They will not do any exclusives. And we found out that was true unless you were Bright Cove because we called up and said we have a really great story and we will only give it to you if you have an exclusive and they said okay. <laughs> so, so stuff like that happens. So don't go by, by what everybody's saying publicly. Um, but pre-briefing makes a big uh, difference. And, and you got to have a substantive story that you're giving them. It can't just be you know, a press release that's just like, we got a new product. Um, the messaging is really essential. You need to capture your key points in your press release or a substantive blog post that really goes through why what you're doing is important. And sometimes you read press releases, it's so superficial, it's ridiculous. You want to have something substantive. And if, you're if you, you take a, a, a featured blog post that's really written by one, not your CEO or not your, your CMO, but it's written by a key architect that actually built out the product or built out these features that you're going to talk about, and they talk about what, what's important in the industry and why what you're doing is so significant, that can get a lot of leverage, whereas um, some, some other author might not. So think carefully about that and how you capture that. And then make those messaging points 
the Bible as you go and talk to press. You know, be very consistent. Make sure you hit those points again and again and again. Don't ad lib every time. And then the other thing is showing, not telling. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, a video is worth you know a million words. Getting a nice, tight demo video that illustrates what you're actually doing and why it's cool is just really, really valuable. So try to use that and then place that. And the real holy grail is to have the, the reporters then take that demo video that you've created and actually embed it in their, in their stories and have that be you know, part of what they do. And then um, cross-functional readiness is really key. And I, I go back to the internal um, aspect of launches. You want to get everybody in your company on the same page. So when you do this launch, the <coughs> every customer facing uh, person knows that the launch is going on. They know what the key messaging points are. So when they get inquiries coming in from customers or partners, they know what to say, and they're on the same page. Okay. So those are some key things that I think come together for a great launch. Any questions so far or comments? Nope. Okay. So um, so it's not just products that you launch. Um, <coughs> just last week I was in. Uh, Dubai launching um, Brightcove. Now, Brightcove is a public 100 million plus company. Why are we launching Brightcove? Well, we were launching Brightcove's Dubai office. And we take nothing for granted. We don't assume that when we open an office in Dubai that everybody knows who Brightcove is. And so <coughs> I was dispatched to go to Dubai and launch that new office. Previously, I have opened up our offices in Seoul, Singapore, Sydney, um, Barcelona, Paris, um, other places. We do country level launches of our company. Um, and we have a little playbook for doing that. First, we develop a target list of media companies in a country where we think we want to enter. And we go and we approach them directly with sales and we try to close some deals with those customers. A handful of referenceable customers is essential. So we win those, then we secure the local real estate, get the legal infrastructure in place to actually be operating in that country, hire the team. We get a local PR agency that's very important, somebody who has real local contacts and knows what's going on in that region. <clears throat> then we book a press conference and invite the key trade and press. So in uh, Dubai, we booked the, the top floor, the 26th or 27th floor of the Burj Al Arab, which is the seven star hotel in Dubai. Uh, we booked the top floor uh, conference room of that, beautiful view, and invited all the top press in the country to come and talk to us there. Um, and then we had a, a, a great press conference, great discussions, did some one-on-ones. They went and wrote a ton of articles about it. And in that press conference, we presented material that was very specific to their market. So I went and did a ton of research on the trends in internet adoption and um, and on uh, you know, smartphone adoption and <coughs> video consumption, brought some data from our own research that was really localized to their particular market. And then we highlighted our customers that we'd want in the market and had some of our customers there to be our references at the press conference. It was a hugely successful launch. Now you may say like Middle East and Africa, is that really the, 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 the big important thing? We don't take it for granted and we use the power of launches in order to really bust through in the market. We have a theory, or a, a saying at Brightco, which is that Brightco should always act and feel 10 feet tall. Even if we're only six feet tall, we should feel like we're 10 feet tall. And we accomplish that by executing launches effectively that really make us feel like a bigger company than we actually are. So that's a little couple of examples of how we've used launches effectively. Um, I think Michael wants to talk a little bit more. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. That's, uh, it's a great uh, and rich story. So we thought what we'd do, given there's so much in there, is we'd just chat a little about th some of these things. So I want to pull out some of the themes that, you know, you may be sitting in the audience and not realize just what you just heard is such a rich set of value. So first of all, um, startups struggle, you know, to get critical mass. Mm -hmm. And you gave them a great tip there, which is instead of just, you know, having a bunch of features that you introduced one at a time, it was pull all these things together and make something that's impactful enough to really get people's attention. So is yeah. that something that applies to brand new startups as well? And how should the... You know I think it does. And, and one of the things that has uh, been sad for me is that with the rollout of um, you know, agile software development and continuous development, you end up with a lot of little features shipping every day. 
And that's cool, and that's great, and there's reasons to do that, and that's great. It's very efficient for the engineering organization. I'll just say for marketing, it, it it's kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> because it's you can't really launch, you know, you can't do 20 launches a month. You, you know, you can't launch every little feature, even though maybe engineering would wish you could. And so in order to really break through, you have to get some critical mass behind what you're doing, and that's where this launch concept comes together. And that's, I think, one of the things that we, we cracked the code on how to do uh, at Branco. Great. By the way, as I'm asking questions, feel free to raise your hand and, and uh, ask any yourself too. So another thing that you jumped into, which I think is very important for startups, is it's very hard to get above the noise. And so often a great way to do that is when somebody else is making a bunch of noise is leverage that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you gave a great example, you know, Apple's developer conference, there's thousands of people, it's always sold out in minutes. You know, how do you do that? How do you leverage something like that or, you know? Yeah. So let me tell you a story um, that I, meant, I meant to tell earlier, so this gives me an opportunity to do that. Um, so we had been hard at work at Bright Cove on um, video players that were based on HTML5 for some time because we knew that Flash was kind of going down the tubes and that, you know, HTML5 was going to be the way, the way forward. And we'd been working on that, you know, for, for a while. But then the iPad came out as a new device, and and we knew that the iPad, it had been leaked that the iPad was coming. There was, uh, you know, announcement that the iPad was coming, and then there was the date it was going to ship. And we started to get all kinds of inbound, um, panicked calls from our customers saying, "This new transformative device is going to ship. How are we going to?" actually respond to that and how are we going to you know get our content on it is our video going to play is it all going to work and we had a good story we said yeah it actually absolutely is going to work and it's going to work with our new html5 players now what we realized after we got all these panic calls from customers was that the market was just hot and ripe for the story right and so what we decided to do was right before the commercial availability of the ipad to go out to the market with a story to say Bright Cove is iPad enabling all of the web's video. And we're doing that, you know, now. Sounds and so like a marketing pitch to me. You basically <laughs> were just using HTML5, but yeah, so yeah, that's exactly. your point. <laughs> exactly. I mean <laughs> Exactly. This is marketing, by <laughs> the way. This is marketing. <laughs> but, but but it was fascinating because the media was just in a frenzy about the iPad at that time. Mm -hmm. And so to come up with a conflict story of, oh, the iPad is coming, but unless something happens content all across the web is not going to work on it, yep. and all the media companies in the world are all worked up about it, is, was a really interesting story. I mean, I was on NPR talking to them about this, this uh, customer demand for getting the content onto the iPad, and you know, that just doesn't happen um, because of my good looks. It happens because the, the timing was right and we had the right story at that time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And in fact, I encourage all of you to think about that because it's very hard to get above the noise when you're a startup with no brand. I mean, Bright Cove has some brand, but there are great startups that do this all the time. It's basic guerrilla marketing. Is they figure out how to feed off something that's already going on where somebody else is creating the noise and, and they insert themselves into it. Yeah, I mean, we just did this this week, by the way. I mean, Chromecast, um, Google shipped Chromecast, um, Open Developer SDK. We happened to have been working with them around that. We didn't know that they were going to make it publicly available, but we had done a bunch of work. And so when they all of a sudden surprised us by making it publicly available, we said, let's scramble and let's go do an announcement that we support the new S you know, SDK. And uh, we, we built a, a really detailed article, got a pitch to Recode, um, Kara Swisher's new venture, and they reposted our um, CTO's blog post verbatim you know, as an original article on that because they were looking for how to make sense of, of Chromecast, and we were there with the story. Great. Uh, so I want to lead to the second part of our agenda. You're, you're hearing all the sort of, okay, we can do these kinds of launches and these kinds of things, but you can't do it unless you've got some of the key elements that we're about to talk about, um, brand and messaging and positioning, and you started to highlight some of that. You said an absolutely key word to me, which is consistency. So we're going to talk about how do you get consistency from your brand and your messaging. But I have a, a sort of, question to pose to you, which is, what is it that you do to make your messaging relevant? Because I always used to say to our teams, you know, who cares when they came up with a messaging? Like, sure. what, when does anybody care what we're saying? As you said, lots of press releases are totally bland. What do you do? What's your tip to a startup to say, we get above the noise when you ha have a messaging platform? I think the best messaging actually connects with, with real pain that somebody is feeling, somebody important is feeling. And so 
if you can, and, and, and we'll go through this later on in terms of how we develop our campaign plans, but we start from people and their pain, and then we work messaging next. Great. And that, that helps you be relevant. Great. Well, it's a perfect jumping off point. Thank you very much, Chef. We'll Thank talk you. a little bit later on. Thank you.